Good to see everyone out on this first Sunday of the new year. And uh, because I'll probably forget later, there are some books in the foyer. If you are interested, they are free. It's uh, Dane Ortland's Gentle and Lowly. It will tie in a little bit. Uh, it was actually the last part of chapter 11 uh, that Bill Carter preached back at the end of November and uh, ties into the same passage we are going to be walking through this morning. Well, since it's the first Sunday of the new year, I just wanted to take a moment just to say thank you. Uh, because of your faithfulness and your generosity, we have just been just blessed beyond measure. God has just done uh, incredible works. We have uh, passed our Lottie Moon Christmas offering goal. You still can give to that, so do not feel that if you have not done so, you still can. So I would encourage you to still prayerfully consider uh, your gift. That is a gift that has eternal significance as we uh, do our best to help support our 3,600 international missionaries who are serving across uh, across the, the world. So still continue to pray for that, but we have uh, been blessed already by that. Uh, those that have already uh, just given, um, just as for those who haven't had opportunity. So we are just been blessed. This has been an unbelievable year, and we are just so thankful to God that God is doing a great work, and that is working through you. So just want to hear you hear hear you hear from me. Thank you for your faithfulness, and we're praying and continuing uh, to believe that the best is yet to come. Amen. I was uh, we were in Pittsburgh last weekend, and in Pittsburgh, instead of the ball dropping. It actually goes up at midnight. I don't know. Anyway, it was kind of cool because they look to the future rather than just, you know, looking towards the past. So I thought that was a kind of a cool thing uh, for us, too, that we just we want to constantly celebrate and be thankful of all God's doing. But we want to always be looking towards the future for what he is going to do. So just hope that'll be an encouragement to you this morning as well. Well, with that, we are going to be back in Matthew. I'm so thankful for Denny stepping in last week, and he kicked off Matthew 12. Uh, we had taken a break over the Advent season as we walked through uh, Ruth, and we're able to hopefully uh, glean a lot from uh, that story of God's amazing grace, his sovereign grace and providential hand in the life of Ruth, who would become the great, great grandmother uh, great grandmother of David, King David, and ultimately uh, was in the lineage of King Jesus. And we will see how all this continues to tie in. Because here, as we're walking back through Matthew, Matthew was written to a predominantly Jewish audience. Matthew himself uh, was a Jew, he was a tax collector. He had his booth there in Capernaum, it was a fishing village, and it was there that he encountered Jesus. Of Nazareth, where he encountered the living Christ and was called, as the other disciples were, to come and follow Jesus. So Matthew's gospel is a first-hand account, but I want to encourage you to read through the gospel of Matthew, if you possibly can, read through it uh, in its entirety. Uh, again, we say it all the time, but remember chapters and verses are not inspired, but the Word of God is inspired. And so sometimes chapters and verses kind of get us hung up, or we kind of think these are all uh, different uh, episodes. But it's a continual story. Matthew is writing this continual story of his eyewitness account of Jesus, walking with Jesus, serving with Jesus. So I say that because really when you start there at the end of chapter 11, that was... Again, almost six weeks ago that uh, Bill preached on, and Jesus talks about uh, his yoke is easy and his burden is light, that we are to come to him, all who are heavy laden, all who labor, to come to him, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, yoke upon you. And directly following that, we see where uh, Denny had picked up last week, where the Pharisees are, are kind of ramping up their game, if you would. They're becoming more and more uh, hostile towards Jesus and ultimately even the disciples. Uh, they don't like Jesus. As a matter of fact, the last passage uh, from last week, it talks about how the Pharisees went out and conspired against Jesus, how they were going to literally destroy him. They wanted him dead. Uh, he had committed, uh, in their minds, blasphemy by claiming to be God, but he is God. And they had now sought to get a case against him. So we're going to be picking up today, Matthew 12, verse 15. I know it seems like a lot of up and downs, 
I am going to ask you if you would, again, if you're able to, to stand for the reading of God's word. Um, this is not a, a tradition. This is simply biblical. This is what they did uh, when they were um, so hungry for God's word that they were willing to uh, stand because the reading of God's word is so important. By the way, this is part of our worship. Uh, reading the scriptures, uh, it's, it's, it's song, it's, it's prayers, it's your giving of your tithes and of all of that is an act of worship. So if you would stand with me as we read through Matthew 12, it's kind of a long passage and uh, sections of this we'll be spending more time in the others today. But starting verse 15, verse 15 it says, Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. And many followed him and he healed them all. And ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold my servant whom I have chosen. My beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him. And he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud. Nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. And a smoldering wick he will not quench. Until he brings justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. Then a demon oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, and he healed him, so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this man cast out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brought bro brood of vipers. It's not abroad. I don't know why I always do that. You brood of vipers. How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Let's pray. Father, we pray this morning that you will give us ears to hear, that, Father, our hearts and minds will be open and receptive to your spirit in the speaking and teaching of your word. So, Father, we thank you that we have your word, that your word is life, that, Father, uh, we can continually know you by your word that you have revealed to us and has been inspired by your spirit. So, Father, we thank you for this time we have today, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in December of 1941, Winston Churchill made a trip to the United States. You know, this was during the height of the World War II. He had came to the U.S. to meet with President Roosevelt. The U.S. was still not fully engaged at this point of the war, and so he came to garner additional support to get Roosevelt to commit uh, to the U.S. involvement in the war. But what a lot of people don't realize is when he made that trip while he was here, Churchill actually suffered um, a heart attack. He had had a heart attack here while he was in the U.S. It was kept very private for, for multiple reasons. His doctor, Dr. Moran, even uh, neglected to tell most of the closest people to Churchill because he knew that if Churchill was viewed as weak, that he had had this heart attack, it could greatly uh, endanger uh, the lives of many people. 
if they thought that Churchill was weak, because Churchill had been a, a epitome of strength and standing strong. Well, if you look at this passage, especially this passage in conjunction with the ones we've looked at over uh, last week and, and even back in November, you will see that if you were in this day and time, you may start to wonder uh, about Jesus because the Pharisees are really coming after him very hard at this point. They are uh, become greatly, um, greatly disdained by him. Uh, they want him done. There is probably some hesitation. Uh, people are seeing the miracles. They're hearing from Christ. But there's still some trepidation because, if you would recall, they are looking for a military leader ultimately. They are looking for someone who is going to come and deliver the children of Israel from the oppression of Rome. Someone who's going to come in and, and lead them to victory. But here, as we will see in this passage that in your Bible probably is entitled God's Chosen Servant, this is a passage that Matthew is going to quote uh, very extensively from Isaiah. This is actually the ninth time so far through the book of Matthew that he will quote an Old Testament passage. This is the longest one in which he will quote. He is going to quote from Isaiah 42. And that is a passage that you may be familiar with. It's one of the, uh, the suffering servant uh, passages throughout the book of Isaiah, culminating in Isaiah 53, uh, which is a, a wonderful, wonderful passage. Uh, book of the Bible. I encourage you to take some time in that. And if you recall back in Isaiah, Isaiah is a prophet of God. He's been sent by God to speak to the people. He is to speak and to speak into them of the, the coming danger that they have not obeyed God. They have turned from God. They have turned from his word and he is warning them and he is calling them back. But in this passage, he is going to be speaking of the coming Messiah who is, in fact, Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know if many of you do, and it's uh, okay if you don't. I would encourage you that there are a, a great many books that have been written over the years by the Puritans. And the Puritans, who you kind of think of as being just super, you know, uh, prudish, right? <laughs> and, and, and just very, very uh, prim and proper. But to understand the Puritans is to understand that the Puritans were... Uh, part of the Church of England. They were, by and large, Anglican, but they had believed that the church had not gone far enough. The Anglican church had not gone far enough in breaking free from uh, the Roman Catholic Church. So they were simply trying to purify the church. They were not trying to break from uh, the Church of England. They were trying to purify her. They wanted her to stand more on God's word. Uh, they believed in a separation of church and state, which the Church of England did not believe in. The Church of England was uh, very much connected to the state. But out of the Puritan came a number of uh, great pastors, great Bible teachers. One was Richard Sibbs. Richard Sibbs was born in the late 1500s, around 1575, 77, and lived into uh, the early part of the 1600s. Uh, Richard Sibbs was one of the early Puritans who had a profound impact on many of the Puritans from the 16th and 17th century. And one thing that he wrote was a book called The Bruised Reed. And the bruised reed is exactly taken from this passage as well as Isaiah 42 that we read about today. But this is a quote that Richard Sibbs uh, speaks in the bruised reed. He says, In this we may see the sweet love of God to us, and that he counts the work of our salvation by Christ his greatest service. And in that he will put his only beloved son to that service. It is a reminder that even though Christ cares deeply for those that are battered and beaten and broken, but that Christ himself is a mighty king. He is a mighty warrior who came to seek and to save the lost. And we saw through these first 14 verses in Matthew the, the continued opposition of the Pharisees as they have try to uh, hold tight to tradition and to a very uh, regulated religious life. They were all about checking the boxes. But what the Pharisees missed was the relationship of Christ. They missed Jesus. And they, in turn, ultimately want to get rid of him. So what do we do? What did Jesus do in this 
instant. I'm glad you asked. In verse 15, we see Jesus, because he is God incarnate, says that he is aware of their conspiracy. He is aware of their thoughts. He knows that they are seeking to destroy him. He knows this well, and instead of doing what we like to do in our current culture, uh, he doesn't organize a protest. He doesn't uh, gather people together uh, to block off highways, to uh, create an uproar. But instead, it says that he withdrew from there because he understood that his time had not yet fully come, that the time in which God would ultimately uh, send him forth to the cross that time had not yet come there was still there were things that that God had for Christ to do and notice even though he withdrew it says that many followed him and this is one of the few instances in scripture where we see that it says he healed them all that they were all healed so all these people are coming they're they're literally pressing around Jesus from from every angle they're coming from all over because they've heard about all these miracles they've heard of how he has uh, how he has healed those who are blind those who are deaf those who are uh, unable to walk he has cast out demons as he will do again in this story so he heals them all but notice it says he orders them not to make him known now I don't know about you but I'm thinking if you just got healed from blindness or you've been a a mute your entire life, you've never been able to walk, all these, you know, diseases, you've been healed from leprosy, you've been an outcast, you've been separated from society, and you have now been healed, you're probably going to struggle to keep that to yourself. I'm just thinking. Maybe not. Maybe you'd be like, "Eh, whatever, just another day. But for him to say... And literally, he says, he ordered them not to make him known. Why would he tell them not to make him known? And it was because his time was not yet come. The fullness of time had still been in play. He was not at this point going to go to the cross. He was headed towards the cross, but he is not yet there. So he didn't want to add to uh, the spectacle. He didn't want to add to the craziness. But notice he further gives this explanation in verse 17. He says that this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. You see, Isaiah, hundreds and hundreds of years before Matthew writes his gospel, had already written this next part. So it tells you that those authors of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, they under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They knew the Old Testament. That was the only thing that they had. The New Testament has not been written. The canon of the New Testament has not uh, been put in order. So they knew the Old Testament. So they used the Old Testament even to share the gospel. Hello. (laughs) You know you can share the gospel through the Old Testament. You can walk through the Old Testament and it is all pointing to the coming of the Messiah, the Christ. Isaiah here is pointing to the coming of the Messiah or in this place, as he says, God's chosen servant. Matthew here, uh, we'll we'll start quoting from one of the four passages in Isaiah that are also called the servant songs uh, that Isaiah had written. And these servant songs uh, reference what God will refer to as his chosen servant, who is, in fact, Jesus Christ. So the first thing we want to look at this morning in this passage is the fact that uh, in verse 18, it says, Behold my servant whom I have chosen. So he's speaking directly of Christ, that it is here that God himself has sent forth his son. Now, understand that God didn't just wait and and waited and Adam and Eve sinned and and then Abraham and others came along and all had sinned and wondered what he was going to do. No, before God had even created the Garden of Eden, before he had even breathed life into Adam and Eve, God had already set forth the plan of redemption. The plan of redemption was always in place that God would send forth his only begotten son, that he would come and he would live the very life that that you and I cannot live, that he and he alone would be able to die the death that would satisfy God, that he would literally exchange his life for ours. He came as a servant of God. Jesus came to serve his father. 
You can go over to Matthew 6. We see this in what we would consider the model prayer. You know this as the Lord's Prayer, but the Lord's Prayer is honestly John 17. But here the model prayer in which the disciples had asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. And it is still a model today that that you and I can use as how to pray. And he starts off by addressing the Father. Our Father. It's it's personal. It's intimate. It's, it's, It's a God who is near. It is not some far off being that you cannot have a relationship with. But our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. His name. We sang about it just very short time ago Yahweh he says your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven Jesus was a servant of God who came to fulfill the will of the father we always like to talk about Jesus and God well you know they're they're love and they are love but understand that Jesus came to satisfy the wrath of God do you ever think about what that means that he came to, to literally die on a cross for you and I, for, for our sins. John 6, gospel, the gospel of John writes, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus came from God to do the very will of the Father. John Owen, another one of the great Puritans who was greatly influenced by Richard Sieb, says... When he took on him the form of a servant in our nature, because Jesus takes on flesh and blood. He is God. He is deity. He never ceases to be deity. He takes on flesh and blood. He takes on our human nature. He became what he had never been before. But he did not cease to be what he always had been in his divine nature. He who is God cannot ever cease to be God. Jesus is God incarnate, Emmanuel. Acts 3, Peter standing there after Pentecost, preaching to predominantly a religious crowd. The religious leader says, The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus. Jesus came to serve. Jesus himself declared, I have come not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. He came to serve. And it's a great thing for you and I as we enter a new year to consider our service to the king. You see, when we come to faith in Christ, we commit to a lifetime service. This isn't four years and you get out or or you re-up along the way. No, when we come to faith in Christ, we commit our lives to our king. And we commit ourselves to his service, his good service, his pleasure. We serve at the pleasure of the king most high. And so a new year is always a time to consider and to uh, evaluate how we are using those gifts, those talents, those treasures that that God has blessed you and I with for his kingdom, for his kingdom come. The second thing we see that God has sent his son. Jesus is sent by God. He is sent on what is the greatest rescue mission in the history of the world. He sent his son who left all of glory to come and into this stained, sin-filled world. To live a perfect life that you and I could not and cannot live. He came because the Father sent him. He came to do the work of the Father. God appointed him this task. You know from even early in Genesis it says that God promised to send an offspring of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent. Later God would promise that there would be a descendant of Abraham through whom all the families of the earth will be blessed. Hundreds of years later, God will promise King David that he will raise up a descendant from his royal line whose kingdom will be established forever. Jesus is the chosen servant of God who has been sent to fulfill God's task to redeem the world unto himself. In John chapter 20, in Jesus appearing to the disciples after the resurrection, it says, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood 
among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Jesus was sent here. Jesus was sent for you and I. We, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, are to be sent ones. We are to go and to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was a servant of God. He was sent by God. And then notice in the latter part of verse 18, it says, My beloved with whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. That should sound familiar. That we've, we've heard that phrase in the Bible and other areas. So if you recall in Matthew 3, particularly the baptism of Jesus, it says that then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. We just read that in our catechism this morning, that baptism is by immersion. It, it literally it means to be uh, taken under, to be sunk like a ship. Jesus himself, modeling this force, was baptized and, and went under the water. He went and came up from the water and says, Behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. God loves Jesus. He loves the Son. He loved him and sent him. He is God's greatest delight. We also see this in the transfiguration where Peter, James, and John go up on the mount and there Christ is transfigured before their very eyes. And there again is an audible voice from heaven. This is my beloved son. God delighted in Jesus, his only begotten son. He loves him and is well pleased by him. And then we see further that he is empowered by God. Jesus is empowered by God. We see the Trinity at work. We see here it says, I will put my spirit upon him. That's the very spirit of God, the third member of the Trinity. The Trinity is always at work. It is always at work. It never works against itself. It is always at work together. It is one at work. But Jesus is empowered by God. The very power that Jesus used to heal and to work miracles is there because it is the power of God. Rest upon him by the very Spirit of God. We see again in the Gospel of John, it says in chapter 10, that at that time the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. And it was winter. You've got to love this, speci this specificity so often of Scripture. And Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. It is God incarnate. God calls you and I by name. We are sheep. And as it was in Matthew 9, when it said that Jesus saw them like sheep without a shepherd. He sees us today as we are. He sees us as we will see in this next passage as a bruised reed or a smoldering wick. He sees the struggle. He sees the burden. He sees the difficulties that we go through. And yet he calls to us that if we will come to him, he will give us rest. That we are to come to him and find our rest in him. 
The danger for you and I, and so often we find ourselves as Christians in this place, is we, we like to coin this little phrase. We say, well, I'm, I'm just burned out. Are you? Or are you not connected to the source? Because if we are fully connected in Christ, it's actually an impossibility. You cannot burn out. You can only burn out when the source of power that is the very Spirit of God is flowing freely through our lives. That's why it is so imperative that we abide in Christ. And we talk about service, and service is so important, but not above abiding. So much of our service lacks because we also are not abiding in Christ. Because when we are abiding in Christ, when we are in Christ and he is in us and God's spirit is at work in and through us, it will give us all we need. Because in other other words, what we are working and serving out of is our own strength. And we can't do that. We do not have the ability. We do not have the strength. That's why Paul repetitively over and over and over, we read through all the epistles, he says, in Christ. It is a daily filling. It cannot be a a, a Sunday quick fix, right? This is not a, let me get my fix for the week. I'm going to come and and, and, and where we need this. We need to gather together. We are commanded to gather together. We're commanded to, to be in fellowship with one another, but we have to have that daily intimacy. Now, for many, we know this is a a new year, and so that comes with all kinds of resolutions, and we like to do the whole, you know, new year, new you, right? Well, as a Christian, your new you happened when you placed your faith in Christ. That was when you became new. You don't become new every year. Now, you're new if you are in Christ. That's why the Bible tells us you are a new creation in Christ, for the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We are new when we place our faith in Christ, but then it is a daily walk. Paul reminds us repetitively through Scripture that that he has to daily die to his sin and to his self. Daily. And I'm thinking if the Apostle Paul has got to every day consider where he is in his walk with Christ, how much more so do I need to consider where I am in my daily walk? It's imperative. We cannot go through this life without Christ. And yet for so many of us, our identity has been placed on what we do for Christ, not who we are in Christ. And there is a world of difference. Because for those who are truly resting in Christ, all that we do is out of the strength and power of the Spirit within us. But when we walk in our own strength, which by our flesh, by our natural man, we will do. We will always do things in order to, uh, uh, to make sure things get done. It's, it's who we are. But we are to serve out of the overflow of what Christ is doing in our lives. And that comes when we are refreshed daily in his word. And that doesn't mean a checklist. It's not like, well, I'm gotta, if I read, and look, hey, by all means, get a Bible reading plan, okay? I think it's, I, I mean, I, I use one because I don't know about you've learned this or not, but like my mind is like, you know, I'm like AM on speed dial, right? I'm like, right? So for me to like focus is not always easy. So I do need those guides, but it's not a checklist. Sometimes you just need to sit down and maybe we talk about Matthew. Read through the entire gospel of Matthew in one setting. It won't take you that long. Um, it'll take you less time than to uh, watch any sporting event, to watch any uh, uh, series you watch on television. It'll take you much longer than to read uh, the news, take you much less time than to read the news or follow whatever. But read it through in its setting so you can kind of kind of, you know, feel the whole weight of it rather than just breaking it up. It doesn't mean, again, uh, you're not always going to be able to do that, but where you can, read through. Get a Bible reading plan, certainly, but it's not about checking a box. It's about spending time with your Creator. I don't know about you, but, but I know that if, if we do not spend appropriate time with our spouse or our kids, that, that you know, that's when we, you know, things happen. It's got to be intentional. 
You got to make time. So you have to set aside that time to spend with the Lord. If you're going to abide in Christ, it means there has to be an intentional time that you are going to focus on your walk with Christ. And the more you get in God's word, the more God's word gets in you, gets in you, guess what you're going to find yourself doing? You're going to find you need more time because now you're going to be more time confessing things that God is revealing to you through his word by his spirit. God is going to reveal stuff in your heart that you and I a lot of times may not even realize is actual sin. And see, sin is what keeps us from experiencing the fullness of God. Sin is what keeps us from experiencing the fullness that God has for our life. And so we start to do and we do and we do and our identity becomes in what we do, not who we are. And we forget that we are this bruised reed. We are a smoldering wick. John Bunyan the author of Pilgrim's Progress, another great Puritan. And I would encourage you, if you do want some things that you want to put down this year, if you've never read through Pilgrim's Progress, uh, that you do so. Worst case, get the kids' book. It's phenomenal. There's even a kids' movie that's awesome. Watch with your family. Show it with your grandkids. But this is what he said. But I observed that although I was such a great sinner before conversion... God never burdened me heavily with the guilt of sins committed while I was in ignorance. He only showed me that I was lost if I did not have Christ because I had been a sinner. I saw that I needed a perfect righteousness to present me without fault before God. And this righteousness was nowhere to be found but in the person of Jesus Christ. You see, we are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. We are all sinners by nature, meaning every one of us inherit a sin nature. We get it from our first father, Adam. It's called federal headship. We all have inherited this sin nature. And because of that, we always are trying to work to earn God's affection or try to work to show what we are rather than resting in Christ. And by the way, that is no excuse to not serve that's also equally sin in our lives because you are robbing God of the very gifts and talents he has given you to be displayed for his good and his glory. But to serve out of the abundance of what he is doing in our lives. And this passage here is, uh, as we mentioned earlier, is taken directly from Isaiah 42, which I want to read to you uh, because uh, although Matthew pulls from this, there's some other great lines in this. So in Isaiah 42, it says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen. Remember, he is speaking of Christ, the Messiah, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God, the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. What a a beautiful passage. And Isaiah uh, writes of these servant songs throughout uh, these chapters in uh, in Isaiah. Charles Spurgeon has this to say about this. He says, We are today accepted in the beloved, today absolved from sin, today acquitted at the bar of God. We are now pardoned. Even now are our sins put away. Even now we stand in the sight of God, accepted as though we had never been guilty. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. He is quoting Romans 8, 1. 
There is not a sin in the book of God, even now against one of his people, who dare to lay anything to their charge. There is neither speck, nor spot, nor wrinkle, nor any such thing remaining upon any one believer in the matter of justification in the sight of the judge of all the earth. And that judge is Jesus. And every one of us will one day stand before King Jesus and we will give an account for all that we did with all that he has given us. But we see here it says that he will not quarrel or cry aloud nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. And then again this great passage. Well, a bruised reed. A reed was a very, uh, were very populous. Uh, they're very popular in areas down along the Jordan River. Uh, they would use reeds to make musical instruments. They could make pens. They could make all kinds of things with them. But when a reed became bruised, it was no longer uh, able to be used for any major function. It, a bruised reed would have been just cast aside. Well, here, as, as often in Scripture, Jesus um, and, and, and the authors of Scripture will use these images for us to see ourselves. We are the bruised reed. We are a smoldering wick. If you have a smoldering wick and that wick is not trimmed properly and is not set right, it will produce a lot of smoke but very little light. So you have to trim, you have to do things for that wick to burn brightly. For many of us, we become smoldering wicks. There's only this faint light that is shining instead of being ablaze by what God is doing in and through us. God has called you and I equally to be light, to be salt, to share the good news. But it doesn't end there. That's just the starting point. We're to share the gospel. We are to then as the God's spirit draws people to himself. We cannot save anyone, but we are to share the gospel. And as we share the gospel and, and in God's good timing, he draws forth those people to himself. We are to walk with them and then they are to grow in Christ as we walk with them. And we are to then make disciples. But you understand that disciples have to reproduce. If you're not reproducing, we're not being obedient. And we like to justify this oftentimes as well. We'll think, well, this is, you know, and, and so we get caught up in, in these things and there's nothing wrong. I'm not criticizing, I'm saying, but, but then we spend the next 10 years in a Bible study. But we've never actually taken the Bible and actually gone out and put it to use. We've not shared our faith. We've not allowed it to actually sink into our own hearts to convict us of areas of sin in our lives in ways of service and treasures and all that we have. We so easily justify things because we do them in the name of God. And so we sit and sit and soak and soak and ultimately we sour. And that's why we become like so many Christians who have more information than we know what to do with and are in literal terms very much good for nothing. We can tell you all about the stories of the Bible, but how much has it impacted the way we live our life? How about we look into our own families? How about we examine how is the Lord working in your family? Because how he is at work in your life is going to be affected and is going to be evident in the lives of those that are closest to you. How about your spouse, your kids? Do we take time to examine what it is that God is doing in their lives do we spend time praying? Do we spend time helping them grow to continue to reproduce? Folks, if you've got kids, we are responsible for air. We are responsible to invest until the day God calls us home. If you've got grandkids or great grandkids, you're still responsible. There's not a time in our life that you get to wipe your hands clean and say, my job is done. Your job is done when Jesus says, come home. If he calls you home. Because I think that there's a lot of people who've sat in churches year after year after year who've missed this. Because we're the bruised reed. We're the smoldering wick. And, and Christ calls you. He calls the broken, the, those that are in desperate need. He calls you to himself. But, but then you have to, by faith, trust him. And then from there, you have to walk with him. It's not just a, an occasional thing we get to do. It is our entire life changes. He comes, and even this next passage, we're not going to get uh, into this much, but we see just another case of the Pharisees accusing Jesus of blasphemy. 
It says, then the demon oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him. This is probably the, uh, the, the one person in scripture that if you think, I mean, this guy was not only blind and mute, but demon possessed, right? I mean, this guy, this guy's like checking all the boxes. If, if it can happen, I've had it happen. And yet Matthew does not focus on this man, only that he is healed. Rather, he focuses on the Pharisees and showing that Jesus is better, that Jesus is not about religion. You see, religion is about works. Works is about what I do for God. Works is about our identity and what we do for God rather than our identity in who Christ is in us. Christ calls us. He gives us this great privilege. And so we're not going to walk through this whole thing, but they accuse him of, of blasphemy that he is uh, casting out demons by Beelzebub. So basically that he's casting out demons by Satan. He's got to laugh a little bit about this, right? You got to the Jesus guy, like that's really the best you guys can come up with now. So he challenges them and says, but if it is by the spirit of God that I cast out demons and the kingdom of God has come up on you. Because see, even their own people had, had performed exorcisms, had done these things. And, he, and he's basically mocking them in what they're trying to say. And then he says, or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods? A strong man here is Satan. You see, the problem in the church today is we either make too much of Satan or we don't make anything of him. And we envision Satan as this little, which by the way, this came out of the church. These images came out of the church. This image of this little, uh, little guy in this red suit with a pitchfork and horned ears. And that is the farthest thing from what Satan looks like. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us, Paul tells us, that he disguises himself as an angel of light. That's why he blends in so well and why we are so easily deceived. Because he just blends in like any other person he is active though he is however under the authority of God he cannot scratch his ear or sneeze without God allowing him to do so he is an angel he is not a God he is a fallen angel who is under God's direct authority and so Jesus is, is reminding them here that he has already binded the strong man. We know from Matthew 4 and the temptation of Christ that he, uh, that he has defeated Satan. For you and I, as followers of Christ, Satan has been defeated. Christ defeated sin and death on the cross and through the resurrection. We do not lead to live in fear. And so when he talks here about blasphemy, this is written in it. In a particular time and place, the Pharisees had been right there with Jesus. They knew the truth. They knew all the Old Testament passages better than anyone else. They had memorized the vast majority of the Old Testament. You know how many Bible studies the Pharisees had been in? More than all of us combined. They had more Bible than there was Bible. But because they had all this Bible, they start adding tradition. They start adding these religious rites. But they never exercised their faith. They didn't take what the Bible said. And they didn't use it. And they didn't advance the kingdom. And so they become bitter and angry to the point where they want to see Jesus killed. So Jesus is just reminding them that either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. Again, he comes back, John 15. If you abide in Christ, you will produce fruit. If you are not producing fruit, you're not abiding in Christ. That's just simply what the Bible says. And it says if you're not producing fruit, then he, then he, will, then he will cut away and prune until we do. Here in this passage, William Hendrickson wrote in the exposition of the gospel according to Matthew that for penitence, they substitute hardening, speaking of the Pharisees here, for confession, plotting. Thus, by means of their own criminal and completely inexcusable callousness, they are dooming themselves. Their sin is unpardonable because they are unwilling to tread the path that leads to pardon. For a thief, an adulterer, and a murderer, there is hope. The message of the gospel may cause him to cry out, O God, be merciful to me, the sinner. But when a man has become hardened so that he has made up his mind not to pay any attention to the Spirit, he has placed himself on the road that leads to perdition. The Pharisees are full of religion. They're full of it. But they miss Christ, as so many in the church do today. We are missing that intimate relationship that God has called you and I to. And he calls us as bruised reed 
and smoldering wicks. Two more quotes, I'm going to finish up. This one is one you may have heard. This is a, a, probably the most famous of the quotes that Richard Sibbs ever wrote. He says, are you bruised? Be of good comfort. He calls you. Conceal not your wounds. Open all before him and go to Christ. There is more mercy in him than sin in you. If you want to walk in Christ, then we must spend time with Christ. We must allow the Spirit of God and the Word of God to penetrate our heart, to reveal sin, to reveal areas of hardness. You see, the Word of God melts the heart. It will melt us, and as Ezekiel speaks, when we come to faith in Christ, God takes that heart of stone, and he gives us a heart of flesh. And it is only through that heart of flesh that we even have the desire to love God, to serve God. God does that work. He draws us to himself. And I'll conclude with this last quote from Robert McShane, the old Scottish pastor. Unfathomable oceans of grace are in Christ for you. Dive and dive again. You will never come to the bottom of these depths. How many millions of dazzling pearls and gems are at this moment hid in the deep recesses of the ocean caves? But there are unsearchable riches in Christ. Seek more of them. The Lord enrich you with them. I have always thought it a very pitiful show when great people ornament themselves with brilliance and diamonds. But it is truest wisdom to adorn the soul with Christ and his graces. The only way you can ever start on this path is by coming to faith in Christ. So I want to encourage you that this new year, that may be exactly what some of you need to do. You may have said a prayer. You may have even been baptized. But if you, by faith alone in Christ alone, by grace alone, trusted in Jesus Christ. Because when you meet Jesus, your life changes. You can no longer be the same person because you have the very Spirit of God living inside of you. And that's what Paul is referencing, the fact that you're a new creation in Christ. So maybe for some of you this morning, it's that today is the day of salvation, that you will embrace Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you will start this journey of living for Christ. For others, maybe that's to make that a public proclamation, and that is what we do when we practice baptism. We saw that in our catechism early. That is your public profession of faith. That is you identifying yourself with Christ. It is the most glorious thing outside of trusting in Christ you can do. But it is all just the beginning. It is just the beginning of steps you will take as you will daily grow and grow to be conformed more and more into the image and the person of Jesus Christ. And if you are not serving in a church, we would encourage you to find a church to serve. If this is a church God would have in store for you, we'd encourage you to, to not just sit on the sidelines, but to get in the game, to be a partner. That's why we call it a partnership, because we're not looking for members, because members pay a due and expect to get something in return. A partner says, what can I do? What do you need done around here? Are there things in the church that just simply need to be done? Are there areas in the church that need more hands, that need people to serve? What can I do? Not what's in it for you. So maybe you want to partner with us. We're going to be having a partnership luncheon in two weeks that you can start that process to hear about these and to see if it is, in fact, what God is leading you to do. And then we'll have a series of classes that you can uh, hear about the more specific things. Or maybe you need to get involved in a group that you can grow, and that group can be a Sunday morning group, a Wednesday night group, or I would say the next step further is a discipling group. You should be in some form of discipling group. And that discipling group is going to typically be a, 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 you know, a three or four men or three or four women that are holding each other accountable, that are learning as you grow in Christ, reading the scriptures, taking time to learn God's word, but also being accountable to share your faith to make sure that what you are growing in, you are ultimately reproducing out of. You can't just constantly take in. We must be taking what God is doing in our lives and investing in others. So I just want to encourage you as we are into this new year to get engaged, to find that place that God would have for you. 
But if that first step is that you need to trust in Christ, then I would encourage you to do so this morning. There's cards on the back of the uh, chairs there. You can fill one out. You can let us know personally. You can go online, whatever the case may be, so that we can make sure we can help you as you walk this journey. And this journey is one that has eternal rewards. Father, we come to you this morning just so thankful for your precious word that, God, you have called us to come to you all who are weary and heavy laden. Father, you call us as bruised reeds, as those that are struggling, those that are broken, those that have been through difficulties. For God, you and you alone can give us peace. You and you alone can give us rest. Father, may those this morning who, even as this new year has only been a few days, We've carried over the baggage from last year. We've carried over the bad decisions, the the difficulties that we've experienced, the hurt, the loneliness. Father, may we bring them to the foot of the cross. May we know that, God, you care so much for us. It's why you sent your son. And that, Father, may we come to faith in Christ and lay those burdens at your feet. And God, it doesn't mean that there's not consequences that come with some of our decisions and there's not still going to be difficult days. There may even be many, but but Father, we are not alone, that we will be walking with you and in Christ. May we take ownership, Father, of the decisions we make and may those decisions reflect your good and your glory. May we invest in others. May we seek to reproduce And then they reproduce and reproduce and reproduce. That, Father, there will be a day that we will look back and see the great work that you did in and through each of us. That, Father, we can have all the success by all the earthly measures there are. But, Father, are we investing in the kingdom? Have we placed your kingdom come, your will be done first in our lives? So, Father, we pray that you would be honored, that you'd be glorified in all that we do. And we love you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen.